today on Inspired Money. There's so many mindset things that people say, you know, money doesn't grow on trees, money is the root of all evil. And for me, I had to decide I'm not going to fall prey to those thoughts. Because if you do, then that's what created that fear. I had to look at my relationship with money, the way I thought about money, the way I responded to money in a totally different way to be able to break free from some of those paradigms. This is episode 122 with author of The Brave Art of Motherhood, Rachel Marie Martin. Welcome to Inspired Money. My name is Andy Wong, a managing partner at Runnymede Capital Management. Each week, we bring you an interesting person to help you get inspired, shift your perspectives on money, and achieve incredible things. From making it to giving it away, inspired money means making a difference, creating something bigger than oneself, and maybe, just maybe, making the world a better place. Thank you for joining me. Hey, Inspired Money Maker, welcome back. If this is your first time listening, welcome. We've got a great show for you today. Our guest, Rachel Marie Martin, truly went through a transformation with her relationship with money. Imagine living through a 10-year period of only being able to fill your gas 3 to $4 at a time because money was so tight. Rachel lived in financial crisis and tried to hide it from her community and even her own children. This is a real money turnaround story, inspiring because it's such an extreme turnaround, but we'll also see how mindset, making life changes, and the tactics that can impact your financials for the better. And beyond money, Rachel's personal path is about empowering herself and taking back control. In this episode, you'll learn how to change your relationship with money, why you can't bury your head in the sand and the power of facing your fears, and then the importance of recognizing small benchmarks and milestones along the way. Now let's get inspired with Rachel Marie Martin. Rachel, welcome to Inspired Money. I'm so excited to have you on the show. Well, I am super grateful to be here today. Let's jump right in. What's your earliest childhood memory of money? Well, you know, I had to think about that a little bit, but... For me, it's a saying my grandfather um, used to say. Uh, My grandfather was a farmer in southern Minnesota, and he would always ask us, what do you guys do to keep the wolf from the door? And I never realized until I was an adult that he was really talking about money. My grandpa farmed through the Depression, and, you know, money was always this kind of thing that he always had to fight about. And that would be what I can think back and remember. How did you process that? How did you define it? You know, my parents were, they both worked really hard. My mom, uh, she went, she was one of the first in her family to go to college and she went to business school and I grew up in the early eighties and they always worked to put money on the table and provide. And I always, I would see them working and I had this relationship. I knew that money involved the level of work that my parents uh, went through In fact, there was a time where I turned 10 and my mom uh, worked in like accounting and uh, reinsurance and my mom wasn't home for my birthday because it was during tax time. And my dad said, don't ever disrespect your mom because she's working hard to put money on the table. And gradually I started to realize that my relationship with money because of the idea of the wolf at the door was that there was something I was prowling around that could take it away. And as I grew older, I knew I had to I had to reframe that analogy because then you're always living in fear. And when you live in fear, you're almost shutting down opportunity uh, for abundance. So it sounds like in your childhood, both of your parents were working hard and they were able to provide for you. Yeah, both my parents did. My parents went, you know, now as an adult and a parent, I look back and I think, wow, they really, really worked hard. They, uh, They both had uh, good jobs and they put all of us through private school and we did swimming lessons and piano lessons and they would show up at sporting events. I know now when I go see a football game, it's not, you don't just get in for free. You have to pay. And my parents uh, really worked hard to give us the opportunities that they wanted us to have in life. You wrote the book, The Brave Art of Motherhood, Fight Fear, Gain Confidence and Find Yourself Again. And as part of that, You tell your very personal story, which took you to extremes 
in like financial troubles? I got married very young and I was a little bit naive about money. And I kind of grew up in the generation that you didn't talk about money either. Like the idea of even asking my first memory of money is money was something we just didn't talk about. We didn't, I didn't know what my parents made or went through the bills. I just knew that on this day there'd be, you know, we would get groceries and all of that. And I've worked to change that with my own kids talking about money. And so I, I went into um, getting married. I was, I was a little bit naive about money, I went through this time where money became very scarce. And I was very stuck on this idea of role, that it was my role to be the wife and mother. And it wasn't my spot at that moment to earn the money. It wasn't the, how we divvied things out. And because I kind of turned a blind eye to it, the money issues kept getting worse and worse and worse. And there's, you know, the uh, boiling a frog analogy, you kind of start, you don't realize how bad it's getting because it's so slow. And there was times where it was so severe that I would be counting change to buy corn uh, at the grocery store or uh, creditors would be knocking at my door. And instead of thinking like, this is abnormal, it just became a fabric of my daily life until there was a moment where I decided, you know, I'm not going to live the rest of my life in fear and owing others. I'm going to reclaim my relationship with money. You were a mom to a family and one would just suspect that you're like any other family in suburbia. Well, it, I think that's a very um, interesting place that a lot of people find themselves in suburbia. Uh, I, I think of it as the one disaster away or one moment away from an actual disaster where they're just kind of keeping things together. And from the outside, I really did look like I had it together. Um, but it wasn't because we were making money. It was due to other people stepping in solving the issues that were there. As a parent, I can see how um, I would want to do that. But behind the mask and behind the facade was very, very severe financial crisis. And it was a place of deep shame for myself. Because if you go back to how I was raised, it really didn't match who I thought I was and who I was raised to be and responsible in that way. And yet I was in this place where I didn't know what to do to get out. People would come back to me with like a Dave Ramsey approach or all of that. But the presupposition there is that you have enough money to be able to whittle down the debts. And we were always, always in negative. There was just never enough money. And because I didn't know what to do and because I was so entrenched in my role and, and I was kind of living in fear, it was this place of really intense sadness and sorrow. But I was also desperate to not let the kids know or desperate to not let anybody else know. So I tell people all the time it was very exhausting. I, I lived going to the grocery store, keeping a mental tally in my head, like 398, 504, because I knew I only had X amount of dollars to spend at the cash register. And I didn't want to go through the humiliation of not having enough. So despite it looking like it was all together, it was so uh, mentally draining because every single moment of every day revolved around money, and in those days, not having money. I know that you have seven children. Did this start early, just with, you know, number one, number two, or did it snowball as your family grew? I, in the beginning, no, there was signs of money issues beforehand, but I, I kind of was like the ostrich that put it the head in the sand. Um, and kind of just thought, well, if I don't look at it, I won't, it won't be that bad. And then I, I was in a very uh, patriarchal marriage situation where the spaces that where I lived were, were really to be the mom and the wife. And the part of money wasn't kind of in my wheelhouse, in my belief structures. And when you're in that spot, for anybody from the outside, they're like, well, how in the world could that be? But when you're in the midst of it, you start to question, you don't question your normal because it's your normal. It took somebody from the outside saying, you know, let's talk about your day and this part of your life isn't normal. So with the kids, um, yes, definitely. Uh, it was getting, it would get worse. It, it snowballed. Uh, and the last five years of my marriage were very intense, uh, financial years for me. Very, very, uh, scary years for me, but it was also the moment where 
I knew that I didn't want to pass this legacy on to my kids. And that meant that I had to do the hard thing. I had to break down all the the boxes of how I was supposed to be and actually step into this role of changing my life, which in effect changed theirs. I know that you actually homeschooled as a way to save money. So how did things look on the surface versus what was really going on? Well, from the outside, you would have seen a family that looked like maybe they didn't have a lot of money. We had a house, but nobody knew at that time that it was a house that my parents had bought for us and that my mom and dad took care of the mortgage for nine years. And that's a long time that they stepped in. And, you know, I I, I got to this point where I couldn't keep that legacy going for them either. And um, from the outside, they would have seen like my daughters did ballet, but the only reason they did it was because I volunteered beyond everything else I was doing. And somebody else stepped in and said, I want to provide this opportunity for them. So it meant a lot of me being willing to share with certain people about stuff and the homeschooling, uh, which is funny because it was, it was almost a way to protect that there wasn't resources and money because my, my kids go to public school now. And even though it's public school, I pay money all the time. There's, you know, back to school, the class fees and the the books that you have to buy and tuition. I mean, not tuition, uh, field trips and, you know, it, it's not free. And I'm very aware of that. I'm very aware of the gift that it is for me to be able to write out a check or send in $25 for the classroom fee. Because there were a moment in my life where if somebody had said, I need you to pay the $25, where it would have been severe angst because I would have had to borrow from something else to make that work. Well, your story, I mean, it's all about moms, motherhood, but central to that is just your relationship with money and your kids, your family too. So... Uh, it really is fascinating. Yeah, I was in a pretty uh, pretty emotionally abusive marriage, so I didn't see it all. I didn't have any options, basically. I just believed that I didn't have any options for a long time. And I grew up where divorce wasn't an option. Like, So I, I lived in that that mindset of like, you, you can't get divorced. And in my marriage, it was, you can't, you don't control the money. So I had to basically come face to face and say, We'll forget both of those and then dismantled everything in front of everybody. So people thought I went crazy, but it was because I had to confront these very, very rigid boxes that I found myself in. How did you overcome that? The people that knew me. So I started writing and in my writing, I earned opportunities to travel. And in the travel, I started to make new friends who could sense the dichotomy between the me and, you know, I would say things, they're like, that doesn't make any sense. And it was people on the outside were able to shine light on my inside parts of my life. Like there was like two stories going on. And it was, it was some of them. I remember being at an event once and asking a bunch of questions uh, about what was normal. I mean, it sounds so ridiculous, but I just was so entrenched in this life. And it was them where I would call them up and I would say, I think, I don't know what's, I don't know what's true anymore. Am I going crazy? Cause people at my church would tell me that. And they would say, no, 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 you're on the right path. This is good. I believe in you. So I think part of the reason I'm so passionate about talking about it is because the number of women that I've discovered that have the same kind of hook into them, it's, it's, it's staggering. And so it's, it's talking about the places that most people are silent. That is powerful. And I've heard you talk before about you don't have to solve problems by yourself. True. True. When I, you, you, I think we, we think we're supposed to. And I, even when I felt the most alone, there were still people there holding my arms up in a way without me even realizing it. But I would say in those first couple of years, it was so lonely. Like I was so lonely and my oldest kids disowned me for a while because, you know, I just totally rocked their whole world, dismantled everything. And that's all come for full circle now. But, you know, not only was I dealing with that and severe money issues and trying to figure it out and working, all of a sudden I was dealing with really intense family dynamics. So, boy, I don't know sometimes how I made it through those days. Once you felt this need to change, like you had to do something, 
Where did you start? Well, I started by basically taking my head out of the sand, um, becoming aware, deciding that the roles that I was taught by church or friends at the time or all that were roles that didn't empower our family and kept us in this position of isolation and hiding. And it really started in small ways where I realized I could make money. I think if you have the mindset that it's very difficult to make money, then you're always operating out of it's very difficult to make money. And I changed it with that money is fluid and that I can earn money. And I just changed that internal dialogue. And so I I started with writing online and I started um, earning money there. I remember when I earned a check from Google for $32 and it was this huge moment of, you know, I can earn money. And I started to go back and remember times in my life where I was successful. In my early marriage, I was a merchandiser for Pier 1 Imports and I had gotten offered positions in the Carolinas and it was a, it was a good position to be a, a merchandiser for that area. And I had turned it down because we just decided to take the family in a different direction. So I started tapping into those places of, you can do this. And instead of looking at, I need to solve it immediately, it became a real day by day being willing to celebrate small changes in changing the relationship with money. What kind of writing did you start doing? I started a website. Uh, I've always been an online person. So I started a website. Uh, Originally, it was like I would call it a mom blog back then. And I knew that if I could review homeschool products, homeschool companies would send me the curriculum for free. So I started earning the curriculum in for the house in exchange for me writing about it. And that's really how my business ended up starting was this financial kind of system of bartering back and forth. It provided, it answered a need that I had. And as time grew, as time passed, the the website started to grow um, so that there was more opportunities and we started earning ad revenue and different, it, it, I guess it just started to snowball, but it really did start with this bartering. How can I provide for my family by doing something online? And that sort of newfound strength, the ability to change your mindset, to take your head out of the sand and actually be able to make money on your own. How did that feel? Well, it was a little bit frightening, but empowering at the same time. Uh, One of the things I did, and I encourage, especially women, um, but I encourage people to do is like know your credit. I had lived for years afraid of it. And when you live afraid of it, not knowing it, you you don't even know what you're fighting. And in the early days when I um, was a single mom, after I had started going through my divorce and everything, I remember running my credit score and having this just severe fear. But once I knew it, I knew exactly what I had to battle. And I think that's the part where the more we hide from something, the bigger it can grow but the more we can talk about it and 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 just admit where we are, then we know exactly the steps that we need to take and we can figure out the connections and we actually open up a dialogue for others to find freedom instead of hiding behind that, that there are opportunities. You know, going back to the suburbia where I looked, at, looked like I had it all together, a big eye-opener moment came for me in those early years of blogging. I had gotten sponsored to attend a conference And this company paid for everything for me. And I went to the conference and I'm there. And there was a food company there that asked where you lived. And then um, they pulled your data up from the county that you lived in. And they said, do you know that one third of your county, uh, the kids there don't have enough food every single day? And it was the same kind of reality that I was living in, this mask of having it all together. And yet there are so many people struggling in the same way. And understanding that, that I wasn't alone and that there was others here and let's start talking about it was one of those pivotal moments that helped me decide I'm not going to hide anymore. I'm going to talk about this position, this space, and in the talking, hopefully create a snowball of change. Is that how you first started shifting from shame to being more open? Was it through your writing on your website? It was, definitely. I started writing about uh, just... Uh, if I felt like I was failing as a mom, I would just write about that. And then people would be like, hey, I feel like that too. And I discovered, especially at least seven, eight years ago, 
in the advent of social media, there was this really grand illusion that people had it together. You know, I think we're a little bit more aware now again that social media is social media, the highlight reel. And I started just sharing about my everyday stuff. And gradually, as time went on, I began to share more and more about my own financial journey and this journey of being a single mom, so much so that uh, you and I had talked about that when I was on the Today Show last fall, I actually talked about the journey that I took from changing my financial story. So where I once had deep fear and deep, deep shame, it became what I talked about in a way that I wanted to inspire that this kind of hope that you can change your life. It's not like it's an instant 32-minute switch. It's a day-after-day day progress. Yeah, it's hard to imagine going from a place where you only confided in very few people, I'm guessing your closest friends, to going on the Today Show and broadcasting your story to the world. I shared with them, and which I think is a very important thing, the power of benchmarks. And for me, there were certain things that I could never do in those those days when I didn't have um, financial freedom. And one of them was I could never fill the gas tank on my vehicle. Well, I lived in Minnesota, so half the year it's freezing, which meant half the year I was running into the gas station with change, putting in $3 here, $4 there, and they would see me all the time. And I just, I despised it. And I was living here in Tennessee, because um, that's where I live now, a, a couple years ago. And I realized I just filled my whole gas tank and I didn't even think about it. And I made it a benchmark in my mind as a place that every time I get gas now, I fill up my car, I fill up the tank because to me, it's a reminder of look how far you've come. And even things that are difficult now, you can do the hard things. And that's one of the stories that I shared on the Today Show. And the response to that story was overwhelming. The number of people that have that are either at the, I can only put $3.12 in, to the number of people that are now like, oh my goodness, thank you for giving me a benchmark to celebrate the journey that I've been on. Coming up, we talk about credit reports, feeling shame, and then turning it all around. All that and so much more right after this short break. The show notes for this episode can be found at inspiredmoney.fm forward slash 122. If you're listening in your car or wherever you are, check the show notes if you want to learn more about Rachel and other things mentioned in this episode. It's time for the Runny Mead Money Tip of the Week. Okay, so today, not so much of a tip, more of a discussion. I hope that today's episode is evidence that you can take control of your money and your relationship with money. When you have it, an important thing to do is to share some. It can be a great practice of gratitude and helping others. It feels good and it will come back to you in interesting ways. So I recently posed this question on social media. If you have $20, $40, or $60 to give away or pay it forward, what would you do? If you have a great idea, go to inspiredmoney.fm forward slash Andy, send me an email. I would love to hear your ideas. Here are some of the suggestions that came back. Pete Turner, a former Inspired Money guest, he said two options. One, get a charity on top gift card for whatever amount you have and gift that charity to someone. Let them choose their charity. Two, save the brave. Pete's a big supporter of the Save the Brave Foundation. Go to the website and you can click and donate there with an appropriate amount. Scott says, I love being in line at the grocery store and paying for someone else's groceries. Karen says, buy someone else gas, food, or pay a restaurant tab for a family. Great idea. Lori says that she's thinking about Christmas caroling this Saturday, buying poinsettias with the money, and giving poinsettias to the people we carol to. That sounds fun. Matt says, tip a waiter or waitress in the service industry. Sarah, who I think lives in the Philippines, says to add more money to that and give it to the street children and children in remote areas. People in need will appreciate a single dollar. That is so true. Stephanie says she would buy a microphone for somebody who wants to start a podcast because it sounds like a privileged item or idea, but too many people have stories that need to be heard and they don't know where to start. A good mic can give a boost to that start. That I also agree. Dave 
says that he would go to Waffle House and order a nice meal and then give the rest of the money as a tip. That seems like a win-win. I like that Dave is thinking with his stomach and being generous. Diana says that she would send it to Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota, the most poverty-stricken reservation in the United States. Diane Sawyer did a segment about them, and Diana has been contributing to them ever since. You can search Google for Friends of Pine Ridge Reservation, where the donated items go directly to the organizations on the reservation. No middlemen. My good friend Atta in New Zealand says that she would buy meals for those who cannot buy their own. Lee suggests paying off somebody else's layaway. That's great. Tinjean wrote, donate to feline friends to help TNR. That's trap, neuter, spay, and release of feral cats. Alex says, donate to the Salvation Army pot. Now, my friend Kate, she's funny. She says that it's an interesting question. She'd like to think that she'd buy something really useful for someone needy or an organization, but then she'd have to do a spreadsheet to figure out who to support and what to buy and how to make the money stretch as far as possible. And that's kind of the place that I'm in right now, which is why I post the question trying to get some great ideas. Kate concluded that she'd probably end up donating to her daughter's Thespian Society fundraiser. Each year, they choose a local charity to support. This year's charity helps recent homeless folks turn their house into a home with mattresses, pots and pans, table, and whatever else they get donated. Dawn says randomly give to someone needy. Sky says donate to the ASPCA or help the koalas. I love how she's thinking about the animals. Ray says, in the past, I've bought dinner for folks, bought groceries, and I would do it again. Angel says to buy and give away gift vouchers. Asia says, pay for a few strangers' meals or leave a waiter a big tip. And then Wynn Charles, another former Inspired Money guest, she says, give it to someone who has a disability. She specifically names the organization United Cerebral Palsy, and there is a ucpboston.org website. Thank you, everyone, for so many great ideas. I'm going to share these with my kids at our weekly family meeting. It's going to be hard, but it's also going to be a lot of fun to discuss how we can make a bigger impact through giving this season. That's the Runnymede Money Tip of the Week. As we close out 2019 and plan for 2020, I want to know how we can serve you better in the new year. What did you like about the podcast? What do you hope to hear more of or less of on a weekly basis? I set up a quick survey at inspiredmoney.fm slash survey. That's S-U-R-V-E-Y. And as a thank you for participating, we'll randomly select three winners for Amazon.com gift cards to submit your feedback and help shape the Inspired Money podcast. Again, the link is inspiredmoney.fm slash survey and answer the questions before January 15th to qualify. You're listening to Inspired Money. I'm Andy Wong. Rachel, which was scarier, taking a look at your credit report or hitting publish on your website for the first time when you were going to start opening up with your story? I will tell you that it was the credit report. I lived in so much fear of money. And for anybody that's gone through that story, you know, I always say credit card companies are like drug dealers. They get you to get the credit card. And then if you can't pay, they cut you off and you're, you're, you know, you, you mean nothing. And I had dealt with years and years of people that really couldn't care about me. And I felt helpless. I felt so much shame. And that day that I got the the credit report, I can remember just shaking in fear and shame versus when I hit publish on some of those articles it wasn't the same. It was more like I was moving forward and being empowered by it. And I had to change even the relationship I had with the credit report. I actually watch mine all the time. And to the place of, I'm good. It's good to know information. And, you know, money, uh, there's so many mindset things that people say, you know, money doesn't grow on trees. Money is the root of all evil. And for me, I had to decide I'm not going to fall prey to those thoughts because if you do, then that's what created that fear. I had to look at my relationship with money, the way I thought about money, the way I responded to money in a totally different way to be able to break free from some of those paradigms. How bad was that first credit report? Uh, It wasn't great. I will definitely tell you that. I was after my divorce. I found out that I had $65,000 of debt to my name. 
so that's not always a very fun moment. And uh, but it was also freeing. I know that seem might seem strange, but there was this tremendous freedom of I had been dreading looking at it for so many years, like just terror. And, you know, once you come face to face with it, there's not the power is gone. That was the unbelievable part. So I was terrified running it. I got the reality of it. And then I felt freedom. And I think that that's the hook that money can have on a lot of people is the fear part of seeing what you have to deal with can stop you from getting to the part where you can act in freedom and kind of that power of change. It's amazing what we can accomplish when we actually face our problems. Yeah, it's so true. <laughs> what were your initial steps after facing $65,000 in debt? How do you go about whittling that down and eliminating it? For me in the beginning, it was, first of all, I had to make enough uh, money to pay just the current bills. Uh, there wasn't enough income coming in. I didn't get any child support and I didn't get any alimony. So it was all on my shoulders. And my first line of responsibility was the day-to-day -day stuff, heat, electricity, garbage, uh, that. And I knew that the rest, there was nothing I could do at that moment. I would contact them. They're like, we don't care. But I couldn't do anything about it at that moment because I wasn't making enough money. So the way I attacked it was I need to make more money. And I started becoming creative, started selling things, started figuring out ways to double my income, started making benchmark goals with that. And then I started um, contacting people. I, that was the other thing I did. I started contacting student loans that were in default and all of these. And surprisingly, they, you know, they would work, they work with you. And the student loan company said, you know, if you can pay us $5 for the next nine months, we will take it out of this status we will forgive, it was almost $10,000 worth of uh, late fees or whatever, and you'll be good to go. So I said to them, well, why don't I pay you $45 now? And they said, no, 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 no. We need to see you pay payments for nine months. So I said, okay. And I paid it and I changed the entire status, that whole story with them. I turned the, kind of turned the ship around slowly. But the only reason that happened was because instead of dreading them, I decided to take the bull by the horns and talk with them. And then they worked with me. Hmm. So the more you talk about money, maybe the better? I think so. The more I would share about money, the more freedom, the more opportunities, the more people would say, you know what, what can I do to help? And it wasn't in the type of help like, oh, she's not going to pay it back. It was the more of let's figure out what we can do together. And within writing, especially the last four or five years, I've started to share more and more with with women specifically about let's change our, our dialogue about money and let's not live out of the position of helplessness or if this happens, then I can do it. Like I lived for a long time thinking if the money was fixed, then I could write and speak, which is what I wanted to do. And it, I had it backwards. It really was when I write and speak, then I can start earning money. But I lived giving the if part of money fixing, you know, that part being fixed so much power that it stalled me from doing the things that would actually change my life. I think you, you address that in your book, that so many of us say, I will do this when this happens. I, I did address that. I, I, I think it's a very, and in fact, I believe it's a very common way that we subtly give ourselves an excuse. Like for myself, I would just like, you know, if, if life got less crazy, then I can do this. Well, life doesn't slow down. The life doesn't get less crazy. I, I, I know that from my own life that, you know, every time I think, wow, this week is going to be a chill week, something inevitably comes up. So it's starting to live your if now. Um, it's starting to live, it's starting to live your then now and instead. So you're, I decided, you know what? I want to write and speak. I'm going to do that now. I'm not going to wait. And I, I realized that because you know, I'm 44 and I had started to see that people that I knew that were my age um, were dealing with hard things and several friends of mine had died. And I thought, you know, I don't want to live my life always waiting for a hypothetical if to happen. I'm going to start living it now. Because I don't know, I'm a, I want, I hope I get to be 80 something and sit on a front porch with, in a rocking chair, but I'm not guaranteed it. I, I'm not invincible. 
And so I, in that paradigm, that space is really one of the things that made me take back control because without control, I was just, time was just moving. It was moving and moving and moving. And I knew that I would end up living bitter. And that that's just not who I was. Starting something now versus saying, I will do it, you know, if this happens or what if. It sounds like a really subtle change, but with a significantly different outcome. How difficult a shift is that to actually implement? In the beginning, it's challenging. In the beginning, what I started to do was, if you ever do have a to-do list and you have something that rolls over and over and over, like, I'll call them tomorrow, I'll call them tomorrow, and then it's always on the list. I started taking the thing that I despised the most and doing it first. So I get it out of the way. If it was calling the student loan company, instead of waiting till five that day, I would call them right away in the morning to get it off so that I had good energy for the rest of the day. And even now with uh, regards to if I have something on there that I'm kind of dreading, I just get it over with um, in the beginning. And, you know, I teach my kids that even with homework, like they come home on Friday and they have a bag of homework. And if they wait till Sunday night, they have all weekend. They have to hear me going, did you guys do your homework? Did you do your homework? Versus let's just get it done so that you have that freedom that I I call it the post-college final freedom. And that kind of elation of not having it. And that for me was the subtle shift of tackling the the hard things first. And gradually, they become less and less and less. In speaking with you, I, I hear the importance of the story that you're telling yourself, whether it's money or other things, because you mentioned some of the sayings about money, like money doesn't grow on trees. You want to eliminate that from your thinking. What type of story should one be telling oneself? How did that change for you as your journey was changing drastically? Uh, Well, one of them was that money isn't evil. Uh, That was a bizarre, subtle fallacy I had within me uh, because I always wanted to help people. And uh, I was told once that the best way to help poor people is to not be one. And I realized, you know, everybody's always helping me. Everybody's always having to do this. And I have this passion to help other people. But if I'm always in a place of need, how can I ever step out and help? And so I started to become aware of those things. And I started to live in an idea of abundance. And I tell my kids that all the time. Like, if I hear them say a kind of thing about money. I tell them there's opportunities everywhere. You just have to be open and look for them. My youngest, one of my sons wanted to earn, he wanted to buy a Nintendo Switch. So I said, you have to earn the money. He's tw- he's 14. So this summer he put an ad in our, our local neighborhood Facebook group and got a job, take cleaning up dog poop and earn the money for it. Well, that's the subtle shift for me. Instead of wishing for something, it's deciding what it is, figuring out how to do it, and then having that pride in accomplishment. Like I know that my son is careful with that switch. He's proud of it. He takes care of it because he knows the effort that went into making it. And the other thing that's cool about it is, is, you know, here in Tennessee, you have to be, I, this was, he, you have to be a little bit older to get a job is he figured out how can I earn money when I'm younger? And I think it's changing it from money is challenging to earn to how can I do this? How can I provide a service that can um, bring money back in return? And that relationship where I see it as abundant and that it's not hard to earn anymore has really helped uh, overcome those places of fear. Because I've learned that if I live thinking, oh, that'll never happen, or I'm never going to get out of it. Well, you know, you, you kind of bring your whole energy down low. You, you speak differently. You, you don't open up the opportunities, uh, versus what can I do now? That idea of what can I do now, um, is a very powerful shift. I understand that our histories with money, how we grew up with money, that shapes us. That shapes our own personal views on money, which is why each of us have unique experiences and unique mindsets. Your kids must have different experiences too, because with seven children, 
which congratulations, by the way. Thank you. (laughs) We (laughs) all admire you you for being a single mom to seven kids, but each of them must have very different relationships with money growing up. I'm I'm very glad you asked that because my kids range from 10 to 23. And the relationship my youngest son has with money is very, very different than my oldest two. I have to work a lot with them to remove them from the scarcity mentality that money is there, that kind of fear. And it's just subtle things where I know it's different. My, my youngest guy, if I go to the grocery store, he'll say, Hey, can you get Tic Tacs? Well, if you remember back to earlier on the podcast, when I was at the grocery store counting money in my head, there's no way I would have put a dollar 19 Tic Tacs on the conveyor belt because there's just, there wasn't that margin. So with my youngest, it's more of teaching them a different m- mindset with money b- about the working and making sure, like I did with my son with the Nintendo Switch, that he, I just don't give it to him because I could, I could have just gone and bought it for him. But I knew I needed to teach him the work ethic, the responsibility, the, that kind of growing with it. So my kids all have very different stories with money. My daughter, uh, who's 18, she paid for half her braces because she wanted the metal ones, the, the little bit more expensive. And I said, you know, if you want those, then I need you to pay for half. So she got a job at Starbucks and she paid for them. So for me now, it's this balance because my younger kids have a life experience that is so different. Just this last week, we went to Fort Jackson, South Carolina um, to see my daughter's boyfriend graduate from basic training. And if you think back to my story 10 years ago, there's no way I could have picked them up, put them in a car, drove for three, you know, drove, taken a vacation for two and a half days and come back. So it's kind of teaching them gratitude right now, being thankful for it and still working hard. With any lesson that you're trying to teach your kids, for each kid, it's different. It's not just one way. (laughs) You always have to figure out like... What is each child's experience? How are their personalities different? And then how do you cater <laughs> to them? So right? true. Yeah, it's so true. My my one son, Elijah, who's he's uh, second from the youngest, he is a saver. And he has the patience like you wouldn't believe where he, he will save and save and save. He's still got gift cards and money saved from his birthday because he wants to buy something. Well, my youngest, the second a gift card comes in, he's like, let's go to Target. So it's a different story where I have to actually work with him like on delayed gratification because for him, most of his story has been a different financial story, a story of financial freedom versus kind of that really tightening the belt mentality that we a lot of the older kids lived with. Rachel, how were you able to lift yourself and your kids out of poverty? I stopped listening to all the naysayers. I stopped paying attention to everybody that would say Facebook reaches forever tanked because, you know, I have an online platform. And I just stopped paying attention to everybody that says things can't be done because you hear that everywhere. You hear it on, you know, you scroll through social media or you see it. And I stopped paying attention to that. And I decided to really focus on every single day doing one thing that will change tomorrow. And I tell moms and I tell women and I tell people all the time that if you do that for a year, you've done 365 days of changing your tomorrow. And there's no way that you will be in the same spot as you were when you started. And it's this idea of being okay with the patience and the time that it takes to make the change. Because there's no way that I could have dug myself out in a week or two weeks. You know, it takes a long time to get in debt and it takes a long time to get out of it. But if you know that every single day you're working to change it, then you know that eventually you will get out of that story. So it does go back to your benchmarks and really striving to make small changes. It really does. Small changes. And then I started taking big risks. Uh, You know, Dan, my fiance, and for years we we were business partners for eight years too, but He's a risk taker because he came from um, a different financial story. So I started uh, developing friendships with people that had different stories. You know how you people say that you're a reflection of the five people you spend time with. Well, I knew I needed to change my financial story and my risk story. So I started 
discovering the people with a mindset that I knew I needed to adopt. I knew I couldn't live thinking that it's impossible to earn money. I knew I needed to, why not? That kind of question, well, why can't you do it? Or what's the worst that would happen? And I started to take risks, put myself out there, uh, hit publish on things where even two years ago, prior to that, I would have been like, oh, I don't know if I can do that. And as a result of benchmarks, the slow growth and risk taking, that's where I am now. I love that. You mentioned Facebook. I know that that has been a big part of your success. You have a Facebook group with over 12,000 members. What are some of the common issues that moms face? Because I suspect that many of the people in your communities are moms. Yeah, well, so first of all, my my group has 12,000. My Facebook page has uh, 358,000 right now. And I'm proud of it because it's been a slow growth page to get to 358,000. We didn't have this giant spike and it's been there because it's been consistent growth. But the common issues are not knowing where they fit with regards to money. Uh, I think a lot of times we don't have the conversations. If they're married, they don't have the conversation about money because again, if you go back to the generation where I grew up, People didn't talk about money. And if you don't talk about it, you can't fix it or you can't plan for it. So a lot of it is not having had the conversations. Uh, Sometimes it's they've lost who they are. Uh, You know, they moms spend a lot of time devoted to raising kids, being home. And all of a sudden there comes a day where maybe the youngest is in kindergarten and they we just what are we going to do now? So it's a lot of um, discovering your own self again. And I tell people too all the time that somehow as adults, we've, we don't give ourselves the grace to change. Hence the word midlife crisis. We've attached this idea that it's a crisis. And yet we, you know, we don't expect our kids to always remain the same. My daughter that's 21, I don't expect her to be the same as she was when she was 11. Her interests have changed her, her outlook. And yet somehow we think, oh, we should have had it figured out because I'm 44 right now. I I need to have it all figured out. And I really want to say, you know, life is about this process of change. It's about this ebb and flow and learning new things and giving ourselves grace for the times that we stumbled. And there's no way I'm going to be the same person at 54 that I am now. And that to me has been one of the things that we talk about the most is giving ourselves the space and grace to evolve into who we are now. You've been through a lot. You've been through very difficult times. You've seen a lot of things. What advice do you have for moms who are feeling overwhelmed? Well, overwhelm is, uh, it's an alert. That's what I tell moms, first of all. First of all, I acknowledge I'm feeling overwhelmed. A lot of times we don't even acknowledge our emotions. But if you think of overwhelm as the check engine light on your vehicle, it's an alert that tells you that something isn't working. Now, it sounds like, yeah, duh, but a lot of times we're just like, I'm feeling overwhelmed. But if you know that I'm feeling overwhelmed and you know that something isn't working, that in a time when you're not feeling overwhelmed, you can start to strategize, how do I fix this so that the next time I'm in this situation, I have a better response? And that simple process of understanding that you're not your emotion, you're just experiencing overwhelm, you're just experiencing anger, you're just experiencing fear kind of breaks the hook that it has on who you are because you're allowed to step back and almost decide, you know what? I don't want to live in overwhelm. I don't want to live with that emotion uh, driving anymore. So for those moms, a lot of times I say, well, first you have to break the pattern. And we all know how to do that. Like if you and I were frustrated and just overwhelmed feeling that emotion, and then somebody called and said, hey, you want a million dollars, immediately you would snap out of overwhelm. I mean, it would be instantaneous, your mood would change. So we all have that innate ability within. And it's figuring out how do I tap into that higher level of living and being in those moments. Uh, So for moms, I tell them the best thing you can do is step back even for five minutes, do uh, figure out your strategy for kind of chilling out and then uh, regaining. And then it's do one thing, only one thing, do it well, move on to the next. Start with a small goal. Yeah. You know, in our world teaches, you know, you and I could scroll through Facebook right now and there'd be a course to change your life in four weeks. And I think that it's great. But what do you do on week five? That's always been my question. So for me, 
change isn't a four-week program. It's a lifestyle. I like to ask all the Inspired Money guests, how do you define success? Success for me is having control in my life. I lived out of control for a long time. I lived out of control with money, with emotions. And so for me, it's the control of having the freedom on a Friday to say, you know what, I'm going to the awards banquet for academics at school and being able to get in my car, drive over there at 945, sit there until 1045 and come home. So that control, even though it seems like it's, you know, manipulative, it's actually freedom. And the freedom is the ability to say yes, to say no, and to prioritize my family. All about control. We are steering the ship of our own destiny. You can't control the waves, the storms, all of that, right? Like, you know that things are going to hurt. There's tough stuff that's going to happen in your, our lives. And there's no way to control all of that part. But what we can control is our response to the situation. 